Good morning. morning. Welcome. Yesterday was the 12th day of Christmas, the Feast of Epiphany, uh, celebrating the coming of the wise men, foreigners, to worship a little baby, but not just a little baby. They saw God in flesh, God made manifest. And so our Epiphany season begins today, is a season of light, of the manifestation of God among his people, of that light changing us as the truth of the gospel comes and brings the Holy Spirit into our lives. So the baptism of Jesus is our celebration today, a baptism that now rebounds to us who are baptized in his name. We rise for our first hymn. of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you. For his sake, he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Behold my servant whom I uphold. My chosen. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. And the ends of the earth your possession. 
You shall break them with a rod of iron. And dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold. My chosen, my soul In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. At the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. 
through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for today comes from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord, all nations. Exalt him, all people. For great is his steadfast love toward us. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. The epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and wore a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The 
The congregation may be seated. We invite the children to come forward now for the children's message. Whoops. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Did you guys have a good New Year's? Yeah. Yeah? Yep. So, did you guys open some of these lately? Yeah. Yeah? Before you opened them, could you tell what was inside? No. You shook it sometimes, yes. Okay, sometimes if you shake it, all right, I'm shaking this one pretty good, but I don't hear anything. Because there's nothing in there. <laughs> we might be right. Because these were put to be part of our Christmas program. There might not be anything in here, but there could be. There could be... There, I don't know about books. It'd be a, but, but if it was a book that was shaped exactly that size and they put a box around it, you wouldn't be able to tell, would you? Now, hold on. Hold it. Is there a book in there? No. That's not heavy enough for a book, is it? No. Now, maybe there could be a really soft blanket in there, a small... And if you had a small, soft blanket, you wouldn't be able to hear it or feel it, right? No? What else could be in here that doesn't make any sound? It doesn't weigh very much. Nothing. Yes, we've established that nothing might be in here. A shirt that's folded, or maybe a, a nice, handsome tie for Nate. Yeah? For Michael, then? Michael, do you want a handsome tie? No. You guys don't like ties? Maybe a pocket square for you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, some things you shake them, and you can tell. Do you guys know the distinctive sound of Legos shaking in a box? No. There's not much that sounds like Legos except Legos, right? So you can, if you shake something, you can tell there's Legos in it. Now, let me ask you this. If I had a flashlight that was on wrapped in here, do you think you could tell? Why would you be able to tell if there was a flashlight that was on in here? There'd be a glow, right? The wrapping paper would stop some of the light from getting out, but not all of the light. And there'd be a little bit of light coming out from the end where the, the, the flashlight was on. Now, the, this big word that we used, epiphany, it means shining through. Shining through. So that if I had a light source that was in here, maybe it was a glow-in-the-dark toy no. or, a, or a flashlight or something that had light coming out of it, that I would be able to see some of the light coming through the wrapping paper. And so when we talk about epiphany, we talk about how Jesus, who's God made man, that he became one of us, but the light of God still shined through him in some ways. That there are ways that people who looked at Jesus, they could see the light shining through them. Sometimes they could physically see. Like the end of Epiphany season will be Jesus' transfiguration, where Peter and James and John saw Jesus on a mountain with the light coming through. Right? But what were some other ways that you could look at Jesus and see he's not just a man, he's man and God? We sang about him in our first hymn. What are some ways? So the Magi, when they came, there was some light that told them that Jesus was important. What was that light? The star. The star. The star, the star proclaims the king is here. And then when Jesus does miracles, you can tell that he is not just a regular guy because can regular guys do miracles? Very rarely, right? And so Jesus, he was special. And so his first miracle was turning the water into wine. You can't do that. Nobody else does that. But Jesus showed that he is Lord over creation. And so epiphany means the light shines through. And God is still hidden among us. He remains Emmanuel, God with us. But his light shines through when we get baptized. It's just plain water. 
but he washes people of their sins. When we take communion, it's regular bread and regular wine, but God is present. His light is shining through. And you know what? His light shines through you guys too because he's put his Holy Spirit in each of you. And the light shines through you too. So you're not one of these packages that's empty. No. Nope. You are full of the Holy Spirit. God has claimed you and we can see the light shining through you. Will you give thanks with me? Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the wonders of baptism that you wash away our sins and seal us for eternal life with your Holy Spirit. We pray that we would live in that love and grace so that your light would shine through us as we live in our families, in our communities, everywhere we go. We ask for that light to shine through us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can get a children's bulletin and we'll sing our next hymn. To 
Jesus spoke, the Lord go out to every nation and bring to them the living word and this my invitation. Let every one abandon sin and come in true contrition to be baptized and thereby win for pardon and remission and every bliss inherit. But woe to those who cast aside this grace so freely given. They shall in sin and shame abide and to despair be driven. For born in sin, the works must fail, their strife in never, never. Their pious acts do not avail, and they are lost for peace and mercy to you from the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our text, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Brothers and sisters, these are astounding readings we are treated to this morning. We're privileged to see the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, working together. God worked three as one in creating. We have the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. We have the Father, declaring and making, and the Word being the instrument of His creation. And so, again, the three in one are there at the new creation. When Jesus entered this world, He took on our sins in His baptism. And there, we have the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, alighting on the Word made flesh. And the Father declares His love for His beloved Son. They work together in love. This is our God. All praise to him. And we're privileged also to see in these readings how baptism in the triune name, it works for us. It changes us. John had prophesied a baptism of the Holy Spirit. A baptism not just next level, but transcendent of a baptism that he had done that was for forgiveness of sins. Already a good thing but a baptism of repentance that left you there with a new start, but probably going to need another new start again later. To have the Holy Spirit is not another new start by itself. It's a sealing of God's finished work of your salvation being put upon you. And so John looked forward to that baptism of the Holy Spirit and then bears witness of what God did in Jesus' baptism. There's a dialogue that's created in baptism, which changes the narratives of human lives. And it starts with Jesus. We think about the narrative of the first 30 years of Jesus' life. There's not a lot to say. The Gospels don't give us a lot of detail about those first 30 years because what Jesus was doing was quietly living a perfect 
righteous life. Every law he kept and every person he interacted with, he gave them love and gave honor to God in heaven. Every step of his life, he did that. And the narrative of that life was holiness and vigor. But things changed when he stepped into the waters of the Jordan. Because the life that Jesus had lived, it, it never need die. It doesn't draw attention to itself. It could have gone on quietly forever and ever. And people never known that there was a perfect life being lived. But Jesus came out into the public and he took on the sins that had been washed into the Jordan River by all those repenting and repenting again. He submitted to a baptism of repentance. Then the Gospel of Matthew, John looks at him and says, you shouldn't do that. This isn't a baptism for you because you've got nothing to repent of. But Jesus said, we're doing this to fulfill all righteousness, not just the righteousness of a single lonely life, but the righteousness that would abound to many by grace. So this dialogue, Jesus humbles himself. He opens the door to death for himself. He steps down into sin. But that's the first part of the dialogue. That's the action that Jesus took, making a humble statement and action. And he waits to see how God responds to what he's doing. He doesn't have to wait long at the baptism. The Father had something to say. The Spirit was quickening. The heavens opened, and we see taking us back to that time when Noah waited, waited, waited to come out of the ark, and finally a dove comes and shows him God's peace and new creation the earth being washed clean. So the dove comes down, the Holy Spirit taking on that image in order to tell Jesus peace. Your mission will be blessed to bring peace. And the Father affirming, you are still my son. Though you've taken on sin, you are my beloved. I am with you. This is what Paul's trying to explain to us happens in the dialogue of our baptisms as well. All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Okay, that's that humbling part. But to get baptized is to say, I'm going to take on the death of Jesus. Jesus has said, all who are going to follow me are going to take up their cross to follow me. So in baptism, that's part of what we're saying. I'm willing to take up the cross. I am entering into death with Jesus. It's the stepping down and the changing of the narrative of my life because so much of the rest of my life was grasping and pride. But now I've said, this is who I am. I am a sinner. And it stamps that narrative of Christ's humble mission onto our life. To get to the rising again, we first step down and die to our sins. So how do we exercise this baptism in our life? It's something to exercise daily. We die daily to our sins. We are thoughtful in our prayers, investigating our lives, asking God to show us, God, where do I need to repent? Where do I need to remove something from my life that I've just let grow as a weed? And we're honest in that confession. We say the consequences of sin is death. I've invited death into my life. Show it to me. I don't want to hide from it. I'm not going to make excuses. And I'm not going to say, well, my weed's only a little bit. It's not nearly as bad as my neighbor's weed. Is. Oh, much worse. No. We own what is in our lives. And it is a dying to do that. To say, I was made to be so much more, and I haven't been it. I'm not the person I'm supposed to be. So we accept that death is the right verdict upon us. That's tough. And if it was the only side of the dialogue of baptism, I don't know how we would do it. But see, this is what the world doesn't understand about our practice of our faith, of living out our baptisms daily. They see us dying to sin, and they say, well, that's repression and despairing. You Christians are so negative. You're always saying no to things. Saying no to yourselves. Why die to something your heart wants to do? It's a big world. You can do it. Try it out. See what it's like. 
Why repress it? Why reject what you've been and what you've done instead of celebrating what you've been and what you've done? And the world doesn't understand that that's the part of our dialogue that begins a much greater conversation, a narrative that flips. Because let me ask you this. What in the world of all those teachings of you can do it and try it and be yourself, which of those paths have not led to death? Which of those paths haven't led to that final verdict that says, no, you did what you did, and now your life is over? There's only one path that led through death to resurrection. So this is something, though, that our nature within us, no matter how long we've practiced our faith, there's a part of us that wants to resonate with that message of just be free, just be yourself. How many times do I have to keep repenting Shouldn't I have progressed past this? Or I don't have to repent of those things anymore? Luther once said that baptism drowns the old Adam in us, but that old Adam turns out to be a pretty good swimmer. And you get tired of doing that daily exercise of baptism, of saying, I'm repenting for the same thing I repented for last year. See, we're created beings. To be created means you didn't start you. Somebody outside of you said, I think that there should be a Dan in the world. I'm going to make him. And I didn't start that. But I find myself in it as a created being who at any point in time, God could say, eh, that Dan experiment didn't work. Stop that one. No. He... He's given me this life, and he sustains this life. But I'm not just a created being, because I've been created in the image of a creator, which makes me have a desire to be creative. And for each of us, that creative spark, it it comes in different ways. Like For some of us, that creative spark makes us want to furnish a home and make the place that our families live in a beautiful place. For some of us, the creative spark comes out or I'm going to try and write poetry. Like, why am I going to try and find words that meter and rhyme, but I want to be a poet? For some of us, we garden. We take the things that grow. And we try to organize them and arrange them so that the sights and the smells and everything become a symphony. And there's so many different ways that we all want to be creative. But it doesn't stop in the things of the world that God has given us dominion to do those things in, we say, I want to be creative over me. I want to make me to be my own maker and for the old creator to retire and say, you can do it on your own. You can be the maker of you. See, what an amazing thing then that the Son of God comes down and reverses that narrative. The Son of God comes down, who was a part of creating, not just a only created being, but he is now taking on flesh, becomes both created and the creator. And instead of saying, see, I can do this, I can be the one who's both created and creator, he says, okay, I will be fully created. I'll let God be the one to say what I am. I'll come down as servant, though I was Lord. I'll come down and let God define me. When I step into the waters, we'll see what he says. When I take on sin, we'll see how he reacts. It's a dialogue. We say our part, I am a sinner, and then we wait to listen. What does God have to say in return? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. When the world tells us not to walk the dreary path of repentance, see, that's the response they don't get to. The newness of life. They interrupt before they can hear that part of the dialogue. They say, oh, shh, you don't need to think about death. You don't need to worry about that. That's far away and long gone. Just be who you are. Celebrate you. Live your truth. But death is always there. It becomes a part of everyone's truth. And death is why the narrative needs flipping. Or maybe from a different perspective, 
By grace, we give an insight into this. Rather than death needing to be flipped, the Creator sets death as a bulwark against sin so that sin can't just carry on forever and define you forever. So there'll be a you who wrestles against sin and struggles with sin, but that will come to an end. And by grace, those who are baptized into Christ, there'll be a new beginning and a newness of life that passes through death into eternity. God uses death so that we can't get away from ourselves. So we can't just get to the point where there's no going back. Jesus takes on death and shows that there's a way through death to new life. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we'd no longer be enslaved to sin. And brothers and sisters, this takes faith. Because we have here in this moment, when Jesus is baptized, he goes down, he takes on the sins of the world, and immediately, the dove, and you are my son. And he has that immediate affirmation. But we know that Jesus kept walking that humble path, and that there were times where there was not an immediate affirmation. We follow him to Gethsemane, where he sweats blood. He says, can't this cup be taken from me? He prays. And God's answer to the prayer is not, okay, you asked for it, I'll give it to you. No, he keeps wrestling in prayer and wrestling in prayer, and the answer is Judas showing up with a kiss and armed soldiers and the trial and the beatings. And on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, sometimes the dialogue, it's not immediate. Sometimes the dialogue bears that cross for some time where we're waiting for God to answer. And that's where faith comes in and lifts us up to keep going. To say that we know God answers. That they were in that ark for days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months. But God sent the dove. And he was on that cross for hours in agony. And he was in a tomb for three days. But the glory of the Father raised him up. And so I can wait. Because I know that as long as I wait, even more so will be the glory of his response. That he will come in a moment that you think no one else could have come but him. All praise to him. That the waiting in faith is truly rewarded, brothers and sisters. In the meantime, saying from those crosses, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's not a dereliction of faith. Because those are words that are still reaching, blind to where he is, but trusting that he is out there. And so we can admit a feeling broken. We can admit to feeling lost. When we're in those moments, those grasping prayers reach for God and brothers and sisters, they find God. Waiting for his part of the dialogue lets God be God. And that's the root problem of sin. Not letting God be God, but wanting to replace him with somebody who is not up to the job. We are not ready to be creator of all, master of the universe. And yet, somehow we keep convincing ourselves that we should be. And so that waiting in faith restores the things that are supposed to be. You are my creator. You are my father. So I can wait on you. The answer will come. The answer will come. Whether it be three days, 40 days, we don't know. That's why it's faith. But we know that death no longer has dominion over Jesus, who waited the hardest wait of all. And it no longer has dominion over all who are baptized into his name because he has claimed us. So I want to get specific about some ways that this exercise of our baptism can work in our lives. Because this desire to be the self-made, to be our own creator, it takes so many different forms in our human lives, right? I'll give you an example from James chapter 4. James chapter 4, something you might not think of as being something that is the self-made man rearing his head. But James says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Now, this sounds like a pretty good business plan. 
guys have got a good head on their soldiers. Uh, they're going to go out. They're going to make some money. They've got a plan. They're going to execute the plan. Good job, guys. But look what James says. He says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And he goes on to describe this arrogance of saying, I can plan out my life and know how it's going to go. He says, that arrogance is evil. And you think about what James is saying. That part of me that wants to say, oh, I know how things are going to go. My plan will make reality accord to my plan. It is that desire to be God welling up within me and trying to displace the only one who controls history, the only true God. So the baptized, instead of saying, oh, I know what's going to happen over the next year and how much money I'm going to make, says, not just God willing, we're going to try these things, but the baptized says, thy kingdom come. Knowing that the kingdom is coming, whether we pray for it or not, but praying so that the kingdom will come among us, that we'll recognize the ways it's coming and join with the coming of the kingdom. This is how baptism changes the narratives of our lives. We die to the certainty of our own plans. We rise to the steadfastness of God's own mercies. Another example. The worldly way is to surround our ears, to encircle them with a wall of people who all agree with us. Shouting down any disagreement that might try and get into our ears so that we only hear people who say, yeah, that's right, we're right, they're wrong. Now Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Now, rather than seek out advice from different perspectives, the little God within us tries to limit these other perspectives so that we think, I'll tell you what truth is. What I say is truth. I'm the final arbiter of truth. But the baptized, however, doesn't have self-confidence in these things, but confidence in Jesus as truth incarnate. And we know that we're sent out to all nations and all different perspectives and peoples that are out there in the world. That we're sent bearing the cross of Jesus so that his truth will be manifested through servanthood so we can freely confess things that we don't understand that we don't make sense to us. And we'll never forget the wise men who came from a place where everybody said, oh, you guys are the wise men. You guys know everything. And they left that place across moor and mountain to come to a place that the star was telling them. When they get there, who do they find? No, they're a wise man who's got a crowd of people who are like, oh, yes, you are wise men, and now these wise men are together wise with you. But instead, they find a little baby who's got nothing to say yet. And instead of saying, oh, we followed the wrong star, they said, we worship him, this peasant Jewish baby, and we'll give our treasures over to him because they saw God in man made manifest. Again, the little false creator within, he's refusing help from anyone. I'll do it on my own. But the baptized remembers that Jesus let somebody else carry his cross. We die to pride. We rise to new life. The little God within seeks to put everybody else in their place. But the baptized is ready to take their place. To stand a servant where they were put down. To lift others up, knowing that we'll be lifted up by the Father when the time is right. We die to putting other people in their place. We rise to the Father, sending us to the place where his Son is now, the right hand of God. All authority in heaven and earth given to him and his kingdom coming among us. Brothers and sisters, do you see, the dialogue is wonderful. For the part that we're given to play, to humble ourselves, it seems so hard from the outside, but once we hear God's response, it's wonderful. Because when we confess, he forgives. And when we die, he gives us newness of life. Jesus lived this out, not just so that we would see it and go, okay, it can actually happen, but so we can line up behind him to follow him. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, but brothers and sisters, he has the last word. Dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You are alive in Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
We rise to confess our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Most of the congregation may be seated, but we invite our officers who are newly elected to come forward and be installed. A few of our officers are not able to join us this morning because of health reasons. So as a congregation, we always say we're going to pray for them. That praying has to start uh, a little faster and a little, <laughs> a little harder for health for our new uh, officers. Beloved in the Lord, Holy Scripture admonishes us that all things should be done decently and in order. And to that end, our constitution and bylaws of this congregation establish various offices in which men and women are elected and appointed to serve. In so doing, the church follows the example of the early Christian church, as described in Acts chapter 6. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching and the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's Acts 6, 2-4. The Apostle Peter also writes in his first epistle, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves with the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Annette has been elected to serve as youth leader. David has been elected to serve as vice president. Charlie has been elected to serve as head elder. David has been elected to serve as president. And Suzanne has been elected to serve as Sunday school director. You have been chosen to fill specific offices and positions of responsibility here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church. You are to work with the pastor that our life together in Christ may be orderly and pleasing in God's sight. You are to see that the service of God's house are held at the proper times, that the word of God is purely preached and taught according to the Lutheran confessions, that the sacraments of Christ are administered according to his institution, that provision is made for Christian instruction of young and old, that the erring are admonished and that discipline is maintained. You are to see to the temporal affairs of this congregation that are properly administered, that proper support is provided for all workers in this congregation. You're to assist in caring for the poor and the sick and cultivating harmony among our members and promoting the general welfare of this congregation and in furthering the kingdom of Christ here and throughout the world. While holiness of life and obedience to Christ are expected of all members of this congregation, it's especially important that you, as office bearers in his church, show yourselves by word and example to be faithful to him in service and Christian devotion. So, in the presence of God and of this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the offices entrusted to you, and do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in the Lord and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, then answer, 
I do. I do. Thank you. Now, beloved of the Lord, our dear congregation, you have heard the promises of faithfulness spoken by these men and women whom you have selected to serve as officers of Holy Cross Lutheran Church. Do you promise to support them in their work, to remember them in your prayers, to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you so that he may be glorified and his work be done in our midst? If so, then answer, we do. All right, brothers and sisters in Christ, I install you as officers of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty and most merciful God, enlighten and strengthen you in your offices, that you may be good and faithful stewards to the glory of his name and the good of his people. Amen. Please stand as we all pray together. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have raised up these servants for work among your people. We humbly implore you to grant them, by your Holy Spirit, those gifts needed for the faithful carrying out of their tasks. Most especially, we pray for wisdom, strength, willing hearts, joy in the work ahead of them. Let your blessing rest on this congregation. Strengthen the faith, quicken the love, and enkindle the zeal of all of our members, that your name may be glorified, and that here and in all places under heaven, the kingdom of your Son may be advanced. We remember with thanksgiving those who have faithfully served your people and have now completed their time of service. We pray that in the end of days, we, with all your faithful people, may hear the voice of Christ saying, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the name of the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Amen. You may return to your seats. And we continue our prayers. Heavenly Father, you revealed your Son in the wondrous epiphany in the Jordan. So also, you have revealed your name and blessing to us in holy baptism, declaring us your beloved heirs. Grant that we may daily die to sin and rise to newness of life, living with joy as your baptized children. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, bless all places where your people teach and learn. Guide teachers and students that together we would marvel at your creation and appreciate the depth of your wisdom. We pray for our sister congregation, our Savior Lutheran Church and school, that you would bless them in the school year continuing. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, grant that all those baptized into Christ would receive the boldness of your servant, John, to lead faithful and pure lives in this world, ever mindful of our promised heavenly inheritance. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty Lord, your Son, Jesus, is the Christ and true King of this world. Grant great humility to the rulers of the nations, that they would submit to the preaching of his holy word for the sake of our own souls and for the good of your holy people. Lord, in your mercy. Give comfort and relief to those who are sick, depressed, tired, confused, or in any need, especially those who have asked for our prayers and our hearts at this moment. Watch over all expectant mothers and their children, that they may have a safe delivery and be brought also to the life-giving waters of holy baptism. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, in holy baptism, you have opened the heavens to your children. Grant that all those baptized into your Son would worthily receive the heavenly feast of his body and blood for their salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, you have made us your own people by baptism and granted us your Holy Spirit to confess Christ in word and deed. We remember with thanksgiving those who went before us, who passed the faith on to us, who now rest in Christ from all their labors. Since we have died with Christ through baptism, grant that we be raised with him also. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty Father, as your Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep, you uttered your word and the world was created. In the waters of holy baptism, you have spoken our names and declared us righteous. You have drawn us to Jesus, the light of life, and saved us. Let his light now shine through us, that others may see our good works and give glory to you. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Your brothers and sisters, greet one another in the peace of the Lord.
what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and at all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, you take away.
death completes you. Thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us the this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thy 
may be seen as we have a few announcements. I know everybody loves the Christmas hymns, but don't sleep on the Epiphany hymns. Uh, they can be pretty good too. Uh, a good, good selection of hymnody we have ahead of us the next few weeks. Uh, announcements people want to bring to our attention? Charlie. All right, looking forward to it. Daytimers. Other announcements people want to bring to our attention? Church council meeting next Sunday. Thank you, Mr. President. Other announcements? Mr. Old President. I did an audit of the jars back here. For those of you that don't know, the 27th of this month is the chili cook-off. And at the chili cook-off, we have three jars back here, one with my face on it, one with pastor's face on it, with Jason, who doesn't happen to be here, so we can fill this up. Right. Whoever gets the most money in their jar will get a pie in the face at the chili cook-off. At the chili cook-off, we will auction off who gets to throw the pie. So we're putting money in here for a fundraiser, but then there will also be an auction for the pie thrower. So um, if you want to put a lot of pastors in Jason, that's fantastic. And I will give you a big hug. Or not, depending on how you might prefer that. So... They're back there for you guys to fill up. Right now, Pastor and Jason are neck and neck. I think one of them's got a penny, one of them's got a nickel. Other than that, dollar amounts are the same. Somebody's doing some sneaky eBay bidding I here. I was kind of, I was kind of yeah. I, I just want to. on there because you're still president. Uh, <laughs> no, oh, so we should, we should just change oh, the <laughs> I just want everybody to know Mr. Dave will give you a hug whether you put money in there or not. So you don't need to put money in there if you're looking for a hug. You could put it in. in you might get a better hug. If you <laughs> so we should experiment with this. So <laughs> half of you should all put money in Dave's jar and ask for hugs. And the, <laughs> and the other half in Jason's jar. And you see, we'll, we'll, I'm going to run this over a series of weeks. Well, I'm glad we have an interpreter. If there's going to be speaking in tongues, there better be an interpreter. Um, I just did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what happens if the interpreter is wrong? We're getting into a whole theological pickle here. So we better move on to other announcements. We just started a new Bible class on Sunday. Uh, we're going through the book of Titus. If you want to join us next week, you won't have missed a lot other than the kind of background. Uh, so it's always easy to start in the first couple weeks of a new book. Titus is a good book. I invite you to join us to go through it. It'll be a short Bible class on Sunday. We're continuing our Zoom Bible class, but it's moved back to Wednesday uh, for the next few weeks as long as we... Uh, uh, are not having Wednesday night services. That Zoom Bible class will meet on Wednesdays. And Andy and Nancy will host it in person at their house. But you can also access it by Zoom. And if you want the link for that, it's in the bulletin. I can email it to you, text it to you, whatever. Uh, we're going through hymns of, the, of, of our hymnal and where they've gathered their verses from the Bible, kind of looking into these hymns. So I think Pastor Andy's planning on doing Abide With Me. This, uh, this upcoming Wednesday, and he'll be doing half of it, and I'll have another hymn, so be able to give us your requests for hymns. If you've got a favorite hymn and you want to say, where's the Bible passage from this? I'm happy to go through that, 
And we've got a few requests we're still working through. So we'll be doing this class for a few weeks. Other announcements people want to bring to our attention? Mm -hmm. We'd just like more people to come. For the in-person. Yeah. So we're not that far from here. Mm -hmm. Our big table. Have a couple dogs with large, but they're nice. They're nice dogs. What? They are nice dogs. Plus, Corey usually makes something nice as a dessert. We're not counting on that. It's not guaranteed, but, uh, but it's often there, so it's good to come and get the dessert. You don't get the dessert by Zoom. You just you have to have whatever you have at your own house. So come and join us for that. Other, uh, other announcements? All right, God's blessings on your week.